Um, I'm really pleased to be um, chairing this first session. Um, I'm sure this will be a really interesting day where we'll learn lots, I'll definitely learn lots, and reflect far more also about our practices um, and relationships between democracy and people. Um, so I'm going to just introduce our speakers now, then we'll have interventions of 10 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussions after that. Um, and the focus of the first session is very much on scrutiny and engagement. So looking at scrutiny functions and the structures of legislatures, of parliaments, and how that can be linked to the actual function of engagement. And the, the, the panel will follow, the second panel will follow on the ideas of representation, so we'll follow it very nicely from that. So to my left I've got uh, my third three staff, who is strategic advisor <coughs> at NREF, which is an independent research organisation in Yangon, Myanmar, Burma. And then we have uh, Nisham Hamed, who is a professor of public administration at Chiktakum University from Bangladesh. And then finally, but definitely not least, we've got Maharad Ainu, who is the executive director of the Forum of Social Sciences, which is an independent policy think tank um, in Ethiopia. He's also an academic at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. So we've got excellent panel here to get us started. So without further ado, um, Yafad, do you want to? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Christina, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to have uh, such a good opportunity to present uh, here at the launch of Deepening Democracy uh, Project. So uh, this morning my topic is is the challenges of local legislatures in Myanmar. So in uh, maybe probably you all noticed that Myanmar is currently in a political transition towards a democratic um, society. So that began in 2010. So in 2010, all these like uh, local legislatures at the sub-national level are formed uh, in uh, like uh, at the same time with the, the formation of the national level legislatures. So these are like uh, these all these like uh, local legislatures are made up of both elected MPs and um, um, appointed military representatives. So two elected MPs are um, selected in every five years uh, by the, the general elections. Um, and, and the one fourth of the, the, uh, the seats of each and every like, local legislatures are like, filled up with uh, the appointed military representatives. So like currently, like uh, in um, 12 out of 14 local legislatures, like uh, members of NLD members are leading as um, speakers of like uh, in these local legislatures. But in the previous terms, in all these local legislatures, the uh, USDP, the, uh, and by the way, like uh, NLD is the National League for Democracy, maybe uh, everybody know, and uh, which is the, the, the body led by Aung San Suu Kyi. And uh, so like in previous term, like uh, which is between like uh, 2010 and uh, 2015, um, in all these local legislatures, like uh, the USDP party uh, dominant. So like uh, despite the fact that uh, all these like uh, local legislatures, sub-national legislatures are the very important uh, federal entities of the country, uh, they have been paid uh, very less attention and also they, are, they don't really receive like uh, the proper and enough um, uh, support and, uh, for their em empowerment. So in um, late uh, 2015, I think like right after the 2015 general election, MREF conducted the performance analysis studies on these local legislatures. Nice. So like uh, uh, here, we, I want to show you a quick look there. This is the, the view of the Mandalay region uh, legislatures, like uh, the members of the NLD member, which are in the red, and then they are sitting this side, and then you maybe see that like some of the uh, military representatives, they are sitting alongside like uh, the other side of the parliaments. Uh, so like uh, in terms of like methodology, like uh, the study tried to answer like uh, two broad uh, research questions. Uh, how, first is uh, how effectively did the state and region parliament perform between 2010 and 2015 and how did their performance vary? 
And uh, another question is what challenges, constraints, and opportunities influence the legislative performance of these parliaments to become strong institutions contributing to democratic state building of Myanmar? So we use the qualitative methods uh, through like uh, two main approaches. One is the in-depth studies, which cover like four states and four regions. And um, we conducted key informant interviews, which are like uh, about 120 interviews in total with different key stakeholders. And another approach is the data collection based on the performance, the, the identified performance indicators. Uh, so that approach, like uh, we covered all like uh, 14 states and regions. So the key findings, so in terms of um, key findings, the study identified three like uh, determinants of, um, of the performance, uh, uh, performances of all these local legislatures, structural barriers, subnational level power dynamics, and uh, limitations of institutional and individual capacity. So due to the time limitation, um, so I'm going to focus only on the first two. So uh, the structural barrier. So um, we can say that like uh, the current uh, constitutions uh, permits taking the dual role by the local, the elected members of the local legislatures, uh, uh, so that means that like these uh, uh, members of the local legislatures can take the uh, uh, cabinet position. So specifically the uh, ministerial position in the, the cabinets of the local uh, government. And at the same time, they can also keep their representative role in the legislatures. So like, uh, like maybe we see that like this is this kind of system is we can also like uh, like uh, see in uh, like a uh, different countries also in the in the UK, but and also like uh, this kind of like a uh, system uh, may have like uh, both positive and uh, negative like uh, impacts. Most of the respondents uh, stated that that kind of like a dual system limits the role and the the uh, limit the role of the legislatures and the kind of the dilute the role of the le legislatures and uh, also create underrepresentations in some constituencies. So like uh, we can see the data here. So data uh, shows that like a uh, significant portion of like uh, elected MPs, they took the dual position. So in a uh, uh, smaller like uh, parliaments like Karyan, uh, Mon, and um, uh, Tanindai, like uh, the number is like uh, seems much more like obvious. And also like uh, all these effects of the system are more obvious in these smaller like uh, parliaments. So like uh, uh, let me show you some of the, the, the codes, uh, the set uh, by the deputy speaker of uh, Karyan State Luto and then like uh, here is the by the deputy speaker of the Nendai region. Have you all seen the, the first one? Okay. Yeah. So this is it. And uh, another uh, issue, another like a structural issue is like uh, the, the, the role and the authority granted by the current institution. Uh, the current by the current constitution is uh, very limited. Current constitution to the the, the, the states and regions is very limited. So uh, in uh, two thousand in mid two thousand fifteen, the the law amending to the constitution is approved, and according to that law, uh, several sec several like uh, uh, more sub sectors are added to the legislative list of the the states and region parliaments. So. Uh, uh, like uh, um, these, like uh, um, in, in like in, in terms of like uh, um, uh, like power sharing, like uh, um, these uh, local legislatures uh, feel that like uh, these, even though like uh, despite like uh, a lot of the like uh, area, the the legislative areas, the power, uh, um, the authoritative areas, are uh, like uh, expanded by the uh, by the that law. They seem that there is like no difference at all, like uh, before the law amending and then like after the law amending, the constitution. So what is the result? 
the result is that like uh, there is a, like a lot of like uh, significant limitations in the legislative efforts of these local legislatures. So and uh, you can also see like uh, some like a uh, uh, confusion in uh, uh, between the legislative list of the union legislative list and then like a uh, uh, sub national legislative list. So all these like uh, uh, constraints uh, uh, limits the legislative effectiveness of these local legislatures. So the data shows that uh, and, uh, the, sec the important sector like economic and then like uh, industry, like uh, we have uh, in economic sector, we have uh, no law yet uh, approved. And then like uh, some of the quotes here, but like I need to skip and then too quick. So the, I really need to go this uh, uh, topic, uh, the subnational level like a uh, power dynamics, which is really important. So we can see that in all these local like uh, 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 states and regions actually like uh, um, have a similar like a uh, power dynamics in both like a uh, previous and uh, current um, government terms. So you can see the the power mapping here. So the USDP party, like uh, this is the previous term. Uh, uh, in the parliament, the USDP, the military, so they are quite closer with the executive. And then like uh, a lot of like uh, legislative members, they took the position in the cabinet. So and then like uh, at the time, the NLES is uh, the other side. And then like uh, it is uh, actually like a very limited role for the smaller parties. And most of the smaller parties are the ethnic minority parties. And then the same thing like NLD and then uh, very like uh, close to with the executive side and then like uh, most of the executive uh, most of the legislative members took the the uh, taking the like a position uh, in the cabinet so it's not really like a uh, like uh, different like a similar structure so that kind of uh, structure actually like uh, create some kind of like a power imbalances and um, like uh, limitations for the 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 local legislature, especially in the like uh, oversight uh, effectiveness. So this kind of like uh, uh, quotes, uh, the comments uh, reflect uh, the situation there. So I think like um, I skip this part. So this is it uh, from me today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mia. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So now to the side. Is this you or mine? Yeah, it's you. several reforms. As you can see, I've put them substantive and procedural. These reforms have the potential to make the parliament place the policy in fancy work. But for various reasons, including the <coughs> lack of representation of the opposition, the parliament has declined. Not only to the decline, several conventions are emerging. Now, most of the bills introduced, in the, almost all of the bills introduced in the House are prescribed from this. Now we have more committee hearings on important issues, and there is better scope of public engagement. And my main objective today is to focus on public engagement, the I Parliament, and the principal society organizations interact, and the impact of such interaction on, especially, the budget scrutiny. My main focus is on how such interaction allows them to have better scrutiny of the budget. That's the problem. But I studied three issues. One, 
Și scurtenea părăzilor sunt Beatrice. Scurtenea de cutat. Părăzilor sunt Părăzilor sunt Părăzilor sunt Părăzilor. Părăzilor sunt 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 Părăzilor My colleague, Professor Zohira, will be focused on direct public attention. Now I want to focus on how segregation takes place between parliament and CSOs. And I want to focus on the bilateral process. And see that Bilateral Prefecture is sincerely responsible to the government and the state of the And there are three organizations that are primarily responsible for keeping the budget. And there are two distinct phases in the budgetary process. One is bureaucratic, the other is parliament. Now, we can say that the third stage, I mean, the is emerging is consultation by the government as well as parliament with the public. And that's important for them to say. He has scope for pre budget consultation. That's the duty. We need to have this sort of consultation before. I can't read out everything we have to see that. There are some important groups, but outside of the public, we inform public, not the general one. Especially parliamentary committee chairs, chairs of the presidential committees, senior secretaries, renowned economists, and policy research institutes, economic research groups. These are the groups that the finance minister concerns before finalizing the budget. That's the new trend, and we didn't have this trend three years ago. Formally, part of the parliament and in the vice president, we have parliament as the parliament has the power to to make amendments, auditions, or something like that. But in practice, parliament remains part of parliament. There was for several reasons. One is constitutional restriction on independent body and floor process. That's vitally. The most important, the potential is the most important power that our MP is back. And for all these rules also, bar referring the budget to any committee. But the time period is also limited. These are some of the limitations uh, that MP is faced. But MPs these are now trying to, to, what can I say, to plan that, to overcome those, to, those uh, limitations through interaction with CSOs. There are several CSOs uh, that provide different kinds of support to MPs. And first of all, several CSOs have to provide and support in the creation of all parties that will be caucus on national planning and budget. We have several caucuses, but this caucus is probably the most uh, effective and most important one. A CSO provides data support to MPs scrutinizing the budget, and another CSO provides expert advice to work about budget analysis and monitoring unit that exists within the, within the parliament. They normally often self press for MPs, and this can turn to those CSOs for support of that thing. For one, the Bangladesh parliament doesn't have any expert research support that it can provide to the MPs. So these CSOs are now providing support that the parliament doesn't provide to the MPs. Here, we can see some examples of caucus activities, caucus on the budget. Normally, it holds uh, budget critics in different institutions before the budget. Normally, it holds national budget convention before uh, the budget. And <coughs> that's uh, some of the activities that the, the, the caucus did in 2016, 17, something like that. Now, what is important is that the caucus, rather than focusing on the budget as a whole, is now taking a uh, kind of strategic view. Focusing on those things, they think important, rather than having some kind of wild view, something like that. So like, the issue that is important, poverty, innovation, health, social security, labor and employment, agriculture, indigenous people. These are some of the important issues that normally are not uh, uh, given importance when MPs 
Now, over the past 20, 25 years, we have had a series of elections. We have had five elections since 1995, when the present government came to power. And in all the elections, as you can see, the electoral landscape has been dominated by a single party. For example, in 1995, when the current ruling party came to power, they won 89% of the seats of parliament. And in 2087, 49, 2005, as you can see, was a watershed moment. Uh, it, it was during this election that the opposition, people you know, enthusiastically, went out to elect, and the opposition had some gains, some significant gains. There was, however, that hope that we are, you know, having some kind of multi-party competitive politics. Unfortunately, our hopes were dashed in 2010 when the ruling party won 99.96% of the votes. It was even worse in 2015, which ended with the ruling party winning all the seats in Parliament. This is not by any standard a good sign. Now, as you can see, this was how people enthusiastically voted in 2005. Everybody went out to vote, and that made the difference. In, after the 2005-15 elections, in which the ruling party won 100% of the seats, this is what we had to do. People went out against the government. The government, which was, you know, as the government tells us, was elected by them. This is ironic. Now let me say a few words about you know, how parliamentarians in Ethiopia interact, how they listen to the voices of the people. In Ethiopia, parliamentarians are nominated by the ruling party for election, by the dominant ruling party. This has created its own problems. When you talk to parliamentarians in the course of doing this research, when you talk to parliamentarians, because they are nominated by the ruling party, they said, they told us that they have dual roles. <coughs> they are responsible to the party, and they are also responsible to the electors. This is what they tell us. Unfortunately, the public does not accept this. The public does not buy this. They view the parliamentarians, because they are nominated by the ruling party, <coughs> as representatives of the party, rather than representatives of the people. And this has created a confidence gap between parliamentarians and the citizens. For in most of the most of the most of doing this research, we talk to a large group of people, parliamentarians, opposition members of parliament, civil society, academics, researchers, and what we got was that the involvement of parliamentarians, the involvement of the public in the policy process was very restricted. And not everybody was happy with this. And they wanted their parliamentarians to be more responsive, more responsive to the needs and concerns of the public. And they pointed out that this limited public partic participation in the lawmaking process, in the policy of deeply public involvement in the process, was their major concern, that they were not able to participate effectively in the development in the politics of the country. And they were also very concerned, they were also very concerned about the, re the restrictive political space <coughs> that came out of a series of laws that restricted the role of civil society, <coughs> the role of the media, and the might have also the draconian anti-terrorist law. The government for the past eight or nine years have come with these restrictive laws and according to many people, the intent of these laws has been to stifle dissent and opposition and independent political activity. And at the end of the day, when you talk to people, they tell you the end result of all this has been the entrenchment of one party rule, an authoritarian single party rule. Now, we ask the people what is to be done to strengthen democracy in Italy, because as I said earlier, there is no alternative. There is no alternative to a complex country, to a complex society, as Ethiopia is, to strengthening democracy. 
for peace and stability of both as a country and we as a state and society. Peter pointed out that there was a need to strengthen parliamentary citizen engagement. The parliamentarians must be more responsive to their debt. They also wanted more public participation. They don't want to respect the point of the states. They also demanded that there should be more freedom of expression in the organization. They also are very much interested, they want, for us as a society and as a state, more party competitive, democratic party competitive politics, and they insisted that the government must conduct electoral reform to enable opposition parties to actively participate in the political process. Now, you know, as a person coming from a think tank, a research organization, the policy research organization, I should throw some ideas for further debate for the discourse. I'm not, I'm not trying to be prescriptive, but I am throwing the, the, these ideas you know, to stimulate debate, to stimulate debate on how we can strengthen democracy. You know, because as I said, there is no better alternative. I have said this before and I'll continue to say it. There is no better alternative to strengthening democracy for peace and stability in a very fragile and complex country and society in Ethiopia. One, you know, over the years, you know, Ethiopia is one of the major recipients of you know, foreign assistance, including from the UK. Over the years, much of our much of the assistance that has been come to the country has been for humanitarian requirements. In the relative terms, there has been very little by way of democratic assistance. I think it is time to consider, to reconsider that agenda. There should be more support for democratic assistance and to the same level as, as much as the humanitarian assistance requirements is important. So, you know, we need to revisit the end agenda as well. Second, second, you know, these demonstrations in Ethiopia, this political discontent in Ethiopia that we observed over the past one year, came in the aftermath of unprecedented economic growth in the country. Came in the aftermath of, you know, successes in the reducing poverty, increasing incomes in the country. Which leads one to the conclusion, I think, that sustainable economic growth cannot be guaranteed under an authoritarian political environment. You know, we need in Ethiopia a democratic political order as a sine qua non for sustainable development because it depends on stability. We have to have stability and peace to guarantee our economic growth. And finally, you know, I want to emphasize the point that you know, we cannot view democracy and economic development as separate issues. It is difficult to sustain economic growth under a restrictive and authoritarian political environment. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, our speakers, for keeping to time perfectly, as, which gives us about 25 minutes for questions, clarifications, discussions. And we've looked at an instruction really to three very different countries, but at the same time, we face some of the challenges very different kind of political and historical cultural environments but at the same time sort of got some common themes throughout the three countries in terms of access to the institutions in terms of how does that then link to the structure of those institutions and then i think we ended really well taking the, the bigger picture in terms of how do, can we look at democracy and how does that look in terms of comparison with economic growth can we actually get this entangled the two of them? And actually, a lot of those themes bring very much true to the UK, to Portugal, to France, many countries I work on. Um, so, again, you know, it just shows that looking at different realities, we come back to the same key questions about democracy. So, we're open for questions. I would ask that when you ask a question, if you could just say who you are, which organisation you, you come from, so we'll have an idea, and, and then. We'll move on to see how many questions there are, whether we've done in, in groups or not. So, first question. Can we go for that, that lady first? There's a micro there's two microphones going around, so. Thank you. 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 Th
very much for a really stimulating conversation for a start. Uh, my name is Helen Pankhurst and I work for Care International. Um, a question to all of you really is that it's the issue of party. How transparent is the party? What, how can one analyse the party? Because it seems that we're focusing on parliament, but the, the major constraint to me seems to be located in that party structure. And if I may, another question. The influence of China. Um, maybe I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Miyaka, do you want to start with that? So yes. Party. Okay. You, you, can, you can say from there, that's fine, yeah. Um, I would say that, like, uh, the currently, the how can I say that the NLD party they don't really like, uh, like sort of like, can make a good like a, a strategy, like a between like a, to what extent like a party can influence the political agenda. And the party, to what extent, should encourage the individual leadership that really require the like uh, political transition and the democratic, like uh, building the democratic society. So this is really matter. Yeah. So like, so that kind of situation, that kind of dynamics will keep like uh, going like uh, until like uh, um, at least 2020, and yeah. So we have a, a kind of like um, um, slip hope, both for the like um, the major political party, which should have a, 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 a significant strength in uh, building the the democratic like uh, uh, agenda, and also like uh, should encourage the individual like uh, political leadership, especially like uh, women and also like uh, the ethnic minorities political leadership. But like uh, that uh, party, like uh, um, uh, how can I say the influence, like uh, dominant uh, uh, party position, actually like again, uh, kill the uh, individual leadership and also the the uh, um, how can I say that the ethnic parties' representations in uh, especially in these like uh, ethnic regions local le local levels le uh, local level like uh, administrative and legislative uh, area so that are really like a uh, important area which is uh, very closer to the public to the community to the like a uh, constituency but in this area that one party domination that party influence too much like uh, over influence of the one party is like killing that uh, opportunities mm -hmm. thank you should be looking at the parliament. In fact, one of the, can you hear me? One of the important reasons for the decline of the parliament is the, is the, 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 the lack of agreement between the two main parties in Bangladesh to abide by the rules of the game. One doesn't want to give the benefit to the other. There is some kind of enemy discourse you can see between the two parties. So if a, one party wins the election, the other party boycotts the parliament. So we have had a long culture of boycotting parliament by the opposition parties, even when there was a respectable number of opposition and peace in the, in, the, in the parliament. So that is the most important problem that confronting Bangladesh, lack of agreement between the two main parties. And as long as that this agreement exists. No institution will function properly, not only parliament. Other institutions of governance mm -hmm. will also not work properly. Mm -hmm. So that's our main problem. Yeah, um, you know, in, in Ethiopia, as, as I said earlier, uh, we have a single party uh, system, uh, which is very authoritarian. This party, given its histor historical background, the way it came to power, is it a coalition of five or six major ethnic-based parties. Uh, and of it, you know, for, it, it's a leftist party at the end of the day, given their historical background. 
uh, to this day, despite being in power for the past 25 years, to this day, the, 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 the principle of the party is democratic centralism, which is kind of typical of leftist parties. Uh, so that, that's very telling of the authoritarian nature of the parties that we are having. Uh, the Chinese factor. Um, at present, China is a major investor in the Ethiopian economy, and it provides you know, considerable assistance in building our infrastructure and social facilities, uh, as you may be aware, Helen. Uh, uh, and one, one thing about the Chinese approach, you know, which is very attractive to the Ethiopian government, is they don't you know, bother the Ethiopian government with issues of democracy or human rights. That, that, that is the Chinese style. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying I, I, I'm in full agreement with that, but that, that, that's, that's what the government prefers. So the Chinese factor is an important factor, which is also indirectly influencing the behavior in the West toward this Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Because they are saying there is a Chinese factor. We don't have to bother these guys with democracy and human rights. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mia, I want to come back on the issue of China. So do you want to say, address China now? Yes, yeah. So I, I think like uh, uh, Meherat, uh, uh, point is really like uh, that common like uh, issue for Myanmar. So, like, but we have uh, both negative and uh, like uh, aspect and the positive aspect because like uh, ch uh, we the uh, our like economy and uh, like um, some of the political stability of uh, of of the country really depends on the China influence. So, like in terms of ethnic issues, in terms of like uh, um, like uh, maybe you can also see that recent. Uh, 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 crisis in the uh, Rakhine issues. So uh, China have uh, both uh, the the interest of like uh, uh, stability in the region and also like uh, really like a uh, 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 strong influence in that like uh, ethno religious or ethnic like uh, uh, politics of Myanmar. So the China like uh, play very like a role in the like uh, in terms of like uh, politics, social economics mm -hmm. yeah, aspects of Myanmar. Thank you, the gentleman there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Julia Sen from the London School of Economics. Um, question about uh, Myanmar, if I may. Um, you described the system as being in a formative process. So the question is, what direction is this going to take over the next few years? Second part is, um, we hear about the structural power of the army. What about the Buddhist clergy? and their influence on the system. And the third relates to Emma's article or, or note which was included, and fragility. Um, weak civil so society organizations are typical of a fragile system. Is this changing? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, yes. Um, so what direction in the uh, coming years? So we pretty sure that in uh, at least uh, 2020, like um, the leading party, the NLD, and also the government will be quite busy with like all these like uh, uh, issues, like um, uh, um, uh, like uh, most importantly, like uh, the peace with ethnic, like a uh, peace issue, and also the ethno-religious issue, which is the the crisis in the up, like a uh, like a uh, north in a uh, Rakhine state, and um, but for like in the local level politics, uh, they cannot really make like a uh, um, uh, significant like a uh, uh, room for the local <coughs> level. Uh, uh, um, how can I say that, political space for uh, civil society, for other ethnic like uh, minority parties. So they cannot like uh, create that kind of inclusive, political inclusiveness. Like, so we, at that front, we kind of like, uh, the hope is slim, but I'm not really sure like uh, the negotiation with like uh, ethnic uh, groups 
uh, at the aspect with the at, in the aspect of the like uh, peace maybe we can hope some kind of like a uh, uh, progress because like uh, at energy at this point is really need to have the progress because the 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 they are they are crisis they are they are like uh, 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 challenges in other friend is now they realize that enormously like uh, like challenging much much more challenging so they really need to create the outcome in the ethnic peace process so that is uh, like um, in the things and then like in the um, the army uh, and the thing, uh, the Buddhist uh, uh, clergy the influence. So the, traditionally, like uh, the army and the Buddhist, uh, um, how can I say, the monks, they don't really like uh, go well. So the, they are just kind of like, uh, um, um, they, they do like uh, uh, um, stand like a different position. Because like in the past, like uh, um, all these like uh, Buddhist like, uh, monks and then all these uh, the, uh, Buddhist uh, like uh, religious organizations, they really take the uh, steps in the uh, democratic efforts. Like uh, they, in uh, the, what they did in uh, 2007, they all like uh, came up to the street and then like uh, they all do the like uh, peaceful like a uh, demonstration. But when the political like uh, uh, changes happening, like seems like uh, what we observe is the Buddhist that uh, interest group, the religious interest group have a, a very limited role in a political like a decision making and uh, they don't because they don't really have the right to vote they don't really have right to participate in the political like uh, uh, decision making so that kind of like uh, interest is the, the uh, political interest uh, so is kind of getting high and also they create a lot of like uh, uh, contentious like issue and um, uh, attempts in that like uh, um, 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 how can I say that um, the religious problems and the ethno-religious problems? Yeah. Thank you. We'll actually come back to some of these issues in the next panel, so I think there'll yes. be more discussion. Yeah, that. There's a great. gentleman there with a blue shirt. Yes, please. Uh, thanks very much for three very interesting presentations. Uh, I'm Calvin Fisher uh, at School of Marine from African Studies. Uh, I had a question on Bangladesh. Uh, I noticed you said that. Uh, you said that one of the key constraints about for the Parliament was the floor crossing restriction. I was quite intrigued by that because, at least in Malawi, where, which I know best, uh, it's often seen to be the opposite. But then it's quite about the floor crossing restriction may strengthen parties in some ways. It, can, it also stops, you know, creating MPs jumping around uh, whoever, whichever party is offering them the best deal. I just wonder if you could comment on that, if uh, what this whole crossing restriction is, and how you thought how you thought it cuts in terms of strengthening the problem. I also just wondered on Myanmar. Um, I was intrigued by this, which I, I speak from a position of complete ignorance on Myanmar, of uh, a quarter of MPs being from the military. I just wondered what on earth they do, uh, and I mean, <laughs> Constituencies, and so on. So, uh, I mean, it must be a very, very different job. And I mean, are we just complete military stooges? Do they take anything at all in their role seriously? They legislative role. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nizam, you go first. The constitutional provision restricting floor crossing and floor attendance. It is hard in Parliament in two eyes. It encourages MPs to become more locally oriented rather than nationally oriented because they don't really have freedom to speak out their mind when they take part in debates and other sort of things. And the government really, I mean, in this in the recent world, the bureaucracy is an important factor. Neither the bureaucracy nor the main politics really want these MPs to become policy advocates. So they want them to spend more time at the local level. And the, the government as well as the parties are more receptive to their demands for their involvement in local level activities rather than their involvement in national level activities. So they can't, rather than becoming lawmakers, they just approve and something like that. 
Number two, uh, they, uh, there, are, there are some recommendations from different uh, organizations, CSOs, and different think tanks that this provision may be, but this constitutional uh, provision may be a bit relaxed. Rather than withdrawing the whole thing, you may uh, uh, allow this restriction in two cases. And there is a vote for government formation, something like that, and the budget making things. Other than these two things, there should be more, MPs should be given more freedom uh, uh, in, in other cases. But the main parties don't agree to any of these proposals because, as what you would say, <laughs> that strengthens parties rather than allowing MPs, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we are in a dilemma. The parties don't allow them. The other than parties want to compensate the MPs by allowing them to spend more funds and others spend more time at the local level. But that's a risk to local government and other institutions also. Thank you. Thank you. And the yes. I was just to say that, but I'll say that after. Go on. Okay. So, like uh, military representation in uh, all like uh, legislatures, like uh, both national level legislatures and uh, also local legislature. So that actually issue like uh, uh, easily create the face value of that uh, the constitution and also the current uh, the democratic transition is not really a, a democratic transition and also the con constitution is the the not democratic constitution. But one uh, positive thing I see is that it is, I think it is a good way uh, of socializing like uh, these, like a uh, undemocratic group of uh, group of people, you know, which has been ruled the, like the country for over six, 60 years. So like uh, they now like uh, started seeing the value of the democratic system and also they do the check and balance. Like, and so also like uh, you, if you see like a uh, current uh, efforts of NLD party, which trying to create the supervisory body of the, the, the parliaments, which uh, uh, try to control the, 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 the freedom of the local legislatures. Actually, the local legislatures and the local government are in terms of like a federal like a setting, they, are, they can be seen as uh, independent bodies, which there no point could control by the uh, legislatures of the national level legislatures or national level government. But NLD trying to create that, that, that supervisory like a uh, body uh, controlled by the national level legislatures, uh, uh, which like a uh, control the which try to limit the 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 initiation and the like uh, all these legislative efforts of the the local legislatures was uh, disapproved by the military representatives together with the some of the ethnic MPs uh, ethnic uh, MPs from the eth some of the ethnic uh, parties and also like uh, some of the ethnic MPs of NLD also not really supportive of that kind of idea. So they somehow like uh, go like at some point, go like some kind of like a, 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 a slight uh, right direction in, um, in terms of like a check and balance. So I really see that kind of like a socialization, you know, uh, chance uh, we, we have uh, like uh, having these uh, military representatives in uh, parliaments. So I think this is a... I, it's really interesting. So it's yeah. actually quite a few other parties to do that because the other positions are trying to... Um, we we're sort of running out of time, so I'm going to collect two questions now, and then there's more questions. Uh, so Aileen and then the lady at um, I, I said your name, but can you say who's what? I'm sorry. Um, as Aileen Walker, I was previously... Oh, this is the mic there, sorry. Aileen Walker, previously Director of Public Engagement at the House of Commons, and now working as an associate with Global Partners Governance and Parliamentary Strengthening Overseas. Um, in relation to the lessons from Ethiopia, um, relating to the link between sustainable economic growth and democratic order. Um, I'm assuming these lessons came from within civil society rather than from the executive or the, the, um, the, the legislature. But I'm just wondering what levers are available um, to activists and researchers in Ethiopia to help try and persuade the executive of this. And I'm thinking, for example, of things like our, our international framework, which is called the achievement of SDGs, is this sustainable development goals, or I'm just interested what leaders can mm -hmm. might be at your disposal. <coughs> Thank you. And the lady is a tonight coming. 
Zunetta Herbert I work with the uh, Lee's Foundation the Fucking Year. Um, I wanted to go back actually to the question about the political parties because there is there are um, I mean, one of the problems in Myanmar is that the MLD was really a, 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 a movement yes, before yes. it became, and then in government before it was a political party. So you know, strengthening the, the, the party and democracy within the party mm-hmm. is going to be essential. We don't want to end up like you know Bangladesh and Ethiopia, do But it's very difficult for. Uh, I mean, in every country there are rules about you know parties, <coughs> parties receiving money from uh, foreign. Uh, people, <laughs> uh, organizations, um, and then also um, donors also have very tight restrictions on how much you can engage with political parties, you know, you're not allowed to do lobbying work and under US rules and so on. So there's a need, but there is, you know, clearly, there are so many countries in which this kind of transition is not a transition at all, because I think of the the failure of really democratic parties and, and popular participation at the party level. So, I mean, I just think, you know, maybe this is something that could come out of this work or something that needs to be broadened and, and highlighted. And I just wonder if in Bangladesh, where you've had stronger parties for a long time, if there are any sort of lessons that could be learned from that. Or, I mean, the fact that you mentioned that CSOs are able to support MPs that are um, overseeing the budget, for example. I mean, that would not be allowed in Myanmar, certainly not in Ethiopia. You know, how has that how has that come about? And, and uh, you know, is there is there are there recommendations to be made? You know, from this thing about political party support. Yeah. There's one question from the lady at the back, I think. So I think this will be our last question because we're running out of time. Was there a question there? Yeah. And I think everyone will be happy and everyone will be across from me. So the last question, and then we'll give the first part. Hi, uh, I'm Jay, I'm doing this lecture. I was just wondering, uh, I know this will be addressed in the next part as well, but I was just wondering uh, what role women could play in deepening democracies. Mm. Um, and in particular, I mean, particularly without having to cut the cultural ties that seek to reinforce a position in society. Um, and uh, you don't have to answer this, but I was in particular interested in Myanmar, uh, certain political leader fought to exercise their own democratic rights, but it seems, seems to have slipped back into the accepted female position that she can take. That's really interesting, but as you said, we'll be addressing that on the second panel. So what I'll ask is if um, Merkel can address the question on Ethiopia, and then Lisa can address the situation of parties in Bangladesh, and well, lessons can we learn from that? And then, my effect, if you could finish and address the issue of women representation in Myanmar and the effects of that recently, and then we'll finish that. So, all right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to your question, uh, Ethiopia has, has, has achieved some success in, the, in attaining a CDG and MDG goals. Uh, it's not only the government effort, you know, the civil society sector is very much involved in providing services and providing schooling, health, education to uh, the poor and more, mostly marginalized groups. There is in place a law on civil society which in a way allows you know, services in the social areas but do, does not allow civil society organizations to be involved in human rights issues, democracy, election, or conflict studies. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that the law, there are both local and international NGOs who are doing a great deal of work to help the poor in providing services. So, you know, it's not only the government effort, but the contribution of civil society must also be recognized in this. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, we are not talking about, when we talk about the demanding that the government should amend the civil society law. We are not saying that foreign money should be given to our political parties. Mm. That's not our position. You know, we are saying that there should be freedom of action for civil society to be more involved mm. in society rather than with political parties. You know, uh, that, that's our position in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the Bangladesh case, we said the government doesn't worry much because uh, because of the constitutional restriction, government doesn't face any problem in passing the budget in Parliament. So government can allow some kind of 
activities by CSOs and MPs collaborating with each other, something like that. That is, that is probably the, the most important reason that we have that kind of things, uh, collaboration between. And in Bangladesh, compared with many other, other developing countries, CSOs are more, better, have better support base, uh, better organized, and uh, have historically uh, contributed a lot during the anti-democracy movement and after, during the, uh, after the democracy uh, has been established in the country also. So government, even the government has some kind of, not always has positive attitude towards CSOs, but it cannot always control uh, the CSOs because it seeks support sometimes. It's some kind of uh, give and take sort of thing. The, the, often uh, the government turns to CSOs for different kinds of support also. So it's some kind of situation that exists there. Uh, it's for that reason. Okay. okay. So the women representation in Myanmar currently is kind of, um, we can see that in a transition. Uh, so from like, uh, but comparing to the previous terms and the current uh, terms, uh, the uh, under the leadership of NLD government, uh, uh, we can see like. Uh, the uh, women representation, like uh, previously, is only three percent. In the legislature, is only three percent, and now it's like thirteen percent. So, in the like the when we see the number is increased, but we don't like we don't really s received that uh, national level like a uh, support or the government support uh, of like a uh, women like represent more women more rep women representation at least like a uh, one third representation in uh, either like a uh, uh, um, legislatures or the political parties like uh, when they do the nomination like uh, if they have that like a one third quota uh, then like a uh, women uh, will have more chance to represent in the le uh, legislatures and also in the government. But uh, seems like uh, the government not really supported uh, that idea. Uh, but like uh, the political openness and the space that created by that political openness already creating some kind of like a space for the women leadership, especially for the especially in the uh, local legislatures, like uh, what like even like in a uh, recent uh, issues like we have uh, in uh, Mon uh, 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 local legislatures, uh, women one women one active women MP she stand out uh, for the the uh, very important like a gender like a violence issue uh, to have the like a public hearing in the parliament. So that kind of like a, a space is like a very rare in a, like a previous uh, government terms. So now it's like a, the, that kind of space and that kind of leadership is like a, a, is, is possible in a, this term. So we can see that it's kind of changing, but we really still need the effective support from the government, the national level support from the government. Thank you very much. Well, I think we had an excellent panel, really interesting uh, presentation, really pleasant insights. And really good discussion, which I'm sure we'll carry on in the second panel. We'll have a short break now between coffee. But thank you very much. And can you join me in the intro and appreciation of our panel?